¡Epa! ¡Welcome, welcome, welcome, mi gente! ¡Coquito Empanadas! ¡Hello, hello! ¡El Jogorio está bien por la maceta! I'm going to lower this real quick. Pa, we, pa. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this very special edition of Siembra Sessions. And tonight is called Nuestra Cocina Live. We're here with Chef Yesenia, and we are going to teach you, or she's going to teach you, not me. She's <laughs> going to teach you how to make coquito and empanadas. Welcome, Chef Yesenia. How are you? I am doing great. You can tell I'm ready for the fiesta times, right? <laughs> yeah, we're definitely in mode. I don't have my hat on right now. But, uh, uh, you're definitely in, in holiday mode. I'm sure that you're very excited. You've been busy. I mean, oh my God, like the last couple of months have just been insane. You're making me dizzy for all the <laughs> stuff that you've been doing lately. Um, for those who don't know who you are, why don't you give them a little brief bio? Of course. So first of all, thank you for setting this up with me. We've been talking about this for a while and we finally made it happen. Yes. So uh, Jesenia Gomez, I am from El Salvador and uh, I grew up in Brooklyn. I still live in Brooklyn. By the way, I'm in Brooklyn and George is in San Francisco right now. <laughs> yes. yes, I am in San Fran right now. So it's only it's only 5 30 in the afternoon right now right right so i'm a private chef and also a culinary instructor i do demos i do cooking classes i do private dinners i do meal prep um, i'm also a recipe consultant i mean a hundred million things but it's all related to food which is one of my passions which is why we're here today Absolutely. and um that's a long uh, that's a short Three sentence bio for you. <laughs> well, we're gonna we're gonna get to know you a little bit better tonight because you've invited us into your home. Yes. Um. So you could show us to make like some of the I guess holiday staples of a Latino household, right? Um, coquito, which is uh, primarily a Puerto Rican drink called Little Coconut, right? Coquito. Right. Little um, Coconut. Um, um, very, we're going to make coquito today and empanadas or pastelitos or pastelillos, whichever you want to call it. It's delicious. It's a delicious uh, hand food, right? And I thought it was appropriate to do these two recipes just because you can make it your own. You know, we want to celebrate Puerto Rico. We want to celebrate also just Latin America in general. And yeah. so I thought, why not? You know, there's a fusion, there's a party. Where there's a party, there's a fusion of everything. <laughs> Absolutely. I just want to let everybody know that this is an interactive session. So you can leave comments on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube, wherever you're watching. Uh, we can see the comments here. We'll get to you any questions that you may have. Um, if you're watching this on a replay, it's very important. We're going to give you an email address later on in the broadcast uh, where you can email us and get the actual recipe, the PDFs, so that you could actually do this um, when you watch it on the replay. You could actually go along with the video and uh, and actually be able to create these beautiful, yummy recipes. I wish I was there so I could taste them, though. I'm kind of a little disappointed in that part. But um, nonetheless, uh, we want to welcome you here. Um, I'm going to let Jesenia take it away. But before, again, comment section, share this out to all your people. Um, we just have fun tonight, okay? Una fiesta. So I'm going to let you take it away. All right? Uh, okay, Ready? let's go. So I want to give everyone the opportunity to set themselves up. I, as you can see, have all of my ingredients out. You probably can't see it. So this is a live show, everyone. So basically, everything's going to happen live. Okay, and if you are cooking with me, so we had about 32 people who I emailed recipes to in the last couple of days. If for some reason you didn't get it, I apologize. If you don't have time to get your ingredients today, then I welcome you to make this recipe during the weekend or when you have time. Um, but just want to note, let's Let's have fun. Let's keep it light. Um, I love my cooking classes to be interactive and I love my cooking classes for them to be just light and fun because 
not everyone is on the same level when it comes to cooking, right, George? There are some beginners. All I want you to do is get in the kitchen and make something delicious. If you make a mistake, that's okay. I make mistakes all the time, trust me. All the chefs make mistakes all the time, right? We just learn how to hide them. <laughs> so we're gonna start with the coquito just because um, if you want to have a glass of coquito by the end of class, I want it to be ready for you. So the ingredients that we're going to use is nutmeg. I'm using a fresh, this is the whole nutmeg and I'm going to grate that. I'm using about seven to eight cloves. Okay. So these are glabos. They used to be not my favorite when I was younger. My mom used to put them in tamales and she used to forget to take them out. And guess who would end up with a clove in her mouth every single time? <laughs> but these are great for baking, for savory, for sweet recipes. I then I have um, cardamom pots. If you've never seen these, these are um, mostly from India, but they give baked goods or sweets a really nice flavor. This is, um, you don't have to include this in your coquito if you had a hard time finding it. I do find that it gives it like a slight minty, uh, exotic taste to coquito. So I decided to add that. And then I also have three allspice berries. Now these are traditionally from the Caribbean. They grow in the Caribbean. They also grow in, in Mexico. I have my four um, cinnamon sticks, okay? And then I have my cinnamon stick. George, have you seen this? Oh my God, I've never seen that, that big. <laughs> I wow. brought a pound of cinnamon bark. I'm not sure everybody knows, but cinnamon is the bark of the cinnamon tree. <laughs> So it is, this is like the fresh, it is most delicious. I use it in my arroz con leche. So that's how, that's our spices tonight. And then I have my vanilla extract for those who don't, who don't know vanilla extract. It's actually made out of vanilla beans in a rum or a vodka. So it has alcohol. So you want to make sure that you use the extract because that's the pure vanilla. And for milk, I have here the sweet and condensed milk. The brand doesn't matter. You can choose a brand that you like. I have tried different brands of different milks, coconut milks, and I actually like, um, I like this brand coconut milk that is in my supermarket. And it's actually Jamaican. It's very creamy and it has all the fat at the top. That's my choice, but you can use a coconut milk that you prefer. Here I have Coco Lopez, which is the cream of coconut. This is mandatory. Without this, it's not going to taste like coquito. Okay. And then I have evaporated milk. So if for some reason you don't want to use, you want to make it vegan, you can skip the evaporated milk and add more coconut, more coconut milk. And controversy, I know, I'm going to use dark rum. <laughs> I know, I see your face. It's well, let's, traditionally hold on, let's, made let's with light that. rum, but oh. I'm sticking to Puerto Rican rum at least. <laughs> so, so I want to, I want to talk really quick about, about the rum selection. So when I was growing up, we used pitorro. Pitorro is basically uh, a version of moonshine, a Puerto Rican right. moonshine. Um, so it's not, it's, it's, it's actually traditionally made with pitorro as far as I know. I awesome. mean, different people, different regions have different, I guess, different ideas of what that looks like. I actually play around with rums, pitorro. I use um, Port Morris Distillery in the Bronx has a great coconut Pitorro that I use for my coquito, Ooh. right? And they have a ginger, and they have, the, the ginger one is interesting because there's a variation on the island in Arecibo 
where they use the heavy ginger and lemon zest for their coquito. But oh, I, I digress. I just wanted to talk about the different selections of rum. I've also made it with white Hennessy. Right. Right. So at the end of your recipe, when you're all done, I'm going to tell people what they could do with the leftover coquito on the bottom of the bottle. Oh, I have a very oh special, I have a very special, special bonus tip for you when you're all done. So I'm going to step away around, but again, pick the, pick the liquor that you like, play around with it. Hennessy is great. Pitorro is amazing. Rum is all right. It's generic, but it works. <laughs> I know this gets you really excited, right? And so, like I said, I said, I, I said to George early, earlier, I'm like, I'm not Puerto Rican, but I have drank so much coquito in my life. <laughs> and I used to make it, you know, putting the cans and mixing everything with uh, the ground spices. But I learned this trick from you know who, from Jessica, from the Dining Traveler. And I was IMing with her in some messaging because when she mentioned that she actually boils the spices, the whole spices in the milk, and I tried it and I was like, oh my God, you changed my life, Jessica. And whenever I make coquito or I share this recipe, I give her full credit because I think she got that from her mom. And, um, but I'm gonna show you something extra. It is a very chefy thing right? Which is to toast spices. I'm sure you've heard of that. Indian cooking uses that. And when you toast spices, what it does is that it enhances the oils and aromatics in the spice. I also toast grains, rice, quinoa, anything. And it just, you can smell the nuttiness in your kitchen. So we're going to go to my stove. Now, as we mentioned, this is a live class. This is not a produced class. So you're going to see my face. You're going to see me moving. You're going to see me adjusting the camera, right? Rachel Ray doesn't have to deal with this. Neither does Bobby Flay. <laughs> so if you see me something dropping, go to the floor. Uh, it's live. <laughs> so you're going to need, let's see, a pot, a small pot. You don't need something big. A saucepan is fine. When it comes to flame, I'm using a gas stove. So if you're using like an electric stove, put it on low because electric stoves are really hot. Okay. So George, um, maybe let's ask if anyone in the audience, if you know, if they're cooking with us, um, they can put in the chat questions and you can tell me so I can help them troubleshoot. Absolutely. Um, somebody, uh, Jordana says, I couldn't find cardamom pods. Will ground cardamom work? Yes, ground cardamom would work. However, don't put it in the pot right now add it when we hi jordana jordana and i actually went to high school together <laughs> nice. um put it in when we blend it so keep it on the side all right so i warmed up my pot now i am going to put all the spices that i had that we talked about and i am going to grate about one fourth teaspoon of nutmeg. Nutmeg is a nut, right? The reason why I told Jordana not to put the cardamom pods. Cardamom is a spice that when you cook with it, if you add it too soon into your dishes, it's going to taste really bitter. And it actually, your dish tastes a little off. So that's the reason why I told Jordana not to put it in here with the rest of the spices. So get your, lower your heat, get your evaporated milk open. If for some reason you're having trouble opening the evaporated milk, take your pot off the stove. Okay, don't let your spices burn. So we're literally just toasting the spices for about 30 seconds to a minute and I'm stirring them so that they don't burn. Now, if you put your face in the pot, it smells like Christmas. <laughs> Hi, 
Have you ever done this, George? Have you ever toasted your spices before you add them to your recipes? I have. I have for a certain seafood restaurant that I do. I do a um a, a red snapper that's like uh, wrapped with toasted plantains. So that for that one I do. Um, I've never done it for the coquito though. You can do this for anything. Definitely, it will enhance all of your recipes. Janice Cedeno says hi. Hi, Janice. <laughs> my friend, my a friend lot of our Canada. fans are showing up to support. I love it. <laughs> so, so Janice is a is a is a friend that we have in common. She's from. Uh, she went to school in Maryland. She is a, a sister of your sorority. Um, yes. And she's uh, cool. I haven't seen her in a long time. But hello, Janice. I haven't seen her in a long time either. So we're toasting our spices. And I'm hoping to go down to Maryland in maybe in a couple of months. All right. So I'm adding the evaporated milk. Okay. I'm going to give it a stir. Now, this is the part when I told Jessica that I smelled and tasted arroz con leche, which is another recipe that I think is has 100,000 variations, right? Lasagna has 1,000 variations. Coquito has 1,000 variations. Um, empanadas, pastelillos, we have so many different kinds of recipes, but I think what's important when we're cooking is that we know the basics that we respect the culture where it came from and give it credit, but also make it yours. Add ingredients that you love because we want traditions to be passed down and we want to pass down these traditions, especially to the younger generation, right? Absolutely. Um, Nicole Tambini has a question. She says she doesn't have a blender. Can she use a hand mixer and get the same consistency? Oh, good question, Nicole. I have used the, the hand blender. Um, I would suggest to blend it longer than what I will, because for some reason, when I use the hand blend, the hand, not the hand blender, the um, electric one, right? Pieces of the cream of coconut didn't dissolve. So mm. that's just the tip, okay? Because in a blender, everything, right goes round 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 and gets the salt but using that so, it doesn't so that's a really good chunky, question right? so it's going to be chunky with like little pieces of coconut if you do it that way right yeah i mean i i drank it <laughs> so it, I don't tasted, think that it kind of felt like i was eating pieces of coconut i would like that actually yeah nicole invite me over nicole i want some of that chunky coquito and I think Nicole is the one who wanted to make a pistachio version of the coquito. She That's emailed right. me and I yes. thought that was a great question. So we'll cover that when we, we blend it. So you see over there, my milk is warming. Now it's on low heat. Okay. Cause we want this to steep. We want all the flavors to be infused in the milk. However, we don't want it to burn and or boil and kind of like spill all over our stoves. It's happened to me, folk. Like I'm doing a million things and then all of a sudden there's milk everywhere. You're gonna need a strainer. So while your milk is warming up, you're gonna need a strainer. If you want to have coquito by the end of class, again, this is a different recipe because we're using more milk. I suggest, okay, Take a glass or two and put it in the freezer. This is what they do in bars. They freeze uh, glasses, right, for beer. They put it in the freezer. That way your drink is really, really cold. And I'm gonna show you something fun. I decided to, before you put it in the freezer, this is something you can do later. I decided to put some rum in a bowl and I dip it. This is kind of like margarita style coquitos. Then here I have a mixture of cinnamon, nutmeg, and allspice. And I am going to add it to the rim just like margaritas, right? So if you like a lot of spice in your coquito, this is a way of getting it instead of putting it inside as a garnish. And then I also roll it in dried coconut. So 
it's a little fancy, um, but it's also delicious. <laughs> what do you think of that idea, George? I mean, I, I don't have any here with me, so. <laughs> I'm, <sad. laughs> I'm gonna have to invite you over. So I'm gonna yeah. put it in the freezer because I want my glass to be cold. Now I'm looking over to my milk and it's already warm. You see smoke coming out. Let me turn it over. Give you guys a close up as well. So you see, there's like smoke, there's steam. You can see that, right? And now it's time to turn off the heat. I am actually going to remove it and put it in a bowl and then put it over ice. That's because I want to have coquito by the end of class. I'm going to be honest. There's a whole bottle of coquito in my fridge already. <laughs> We've been drinking coquito since the beginning of November. <laughs> oh, man. So I, I drink my, coquito. My boyfriend is, is Salvadoran. He's not Puerto Rican. And I introduced him to coquito like two years ago. And he just can't have enough of it. He's like, why is it? Why is this recipe only made during the holidays? <laughs> he wants it all year long. <laughs> so, so fun, fun fact. I want to give you a fun fact. Um, one of our really good friends um, uh, owns a company called Flaco Coquito. Yes. Cynthia. So, um, for Cynthia is actually doing something very unique with her coquito. Obviously, it's distilled professionally and it's sold in liquor stores. So go to flacococoquito.com to get more information about that. But one of the things that she, that her and I talked about early on in her journey was the fact that Irish Bailey cream used to be a holiday only drink. And eventually the marketing, the marketing department eventually made headway and started incorporating recipes into everyday life. And now Irish Bailey creams is included in a whole bunch of different types of drinks. But it had a similar history as Coquito where it was only at one point, it was only a Christmas holiday drink. So you could make, we could all make coquito year round. I think that I'm, I'm, I'm with it. I do it anyway. I vote. But I don't know. You want to start a poll? <laughs> I think that if you, if you think that coquito should be drank year round, like different flavors for different months, you know, you could do a red velvet for, for Valentine's day. You could do like a, a citrusy one for like for the spring. I don't know. We could, we could make up something. We can make, make up a, a coquito calendar of different flavors every month. Exactly. And what I love about Flaco Coquito, too, um, is that it's vegan, right? It's vegan and it's actually low, no added sugar. No so added she sugar. Very, she keeps the glycemic load pretty low. So she made it because... And um, I know we have problems. some diabetics in, in the crowd, in the audience. And um, I myself am diabetic, and I, I'm in public with that. I'm not ashamed of saying it. And so I, well, you too, right, George? And so this is a very sweet drink. Um, so what I do to adjust it, I have made my mom coquito, and she really loves it, is that I actually adjust the amount of the condensed milk. I add maybe only half of the can or just a portion. And I only add half of the cream of coconut as well um, so that she can enjoy it. I enjoy it freely just because I, I have adjusted my recipe. So we're gonna continue with the coquito and then we're gonna let our milk cool because as you can see, it's still steaming. So I put it in a bowl with ice. You can put it in the fridge if it fits or in the, in the freezer if it fits. Um, so we're still in the coquito. We are going to now prep the rest of our milks, let's just put it in the blender or put it in a bowl just because I want to get it out of the way. And then we're going to start prepping the empanadas. You guys are going to be, you know, your own chefs at home today. You're going to be multitasking. Chefs don't always do one thing at a time. I do like eight things at a time. The oven's on, the stove is on. So let's put in our milk. So I'm going to give everyone some time. I opened my milk before class just because I've had classes where I'm struggling opening the cans and then everything just ends up. We don't want to be that kind of life class today. 
So I think, um, I think Puerto Rican culture and allowing us to adapt this recipe and share it with the rest of Latin America. Um, but there are other type of drinks also in Latin America. There's ponche. There's um, other like Bailey type style drinks in Peru and they're egg based, but they're similar it's to celebrate, right? The holidays and our culture. Have you had any of those, George? So yeah, I, I've tried a couple of different ones. I tried some from the from the Virgin Islands. I bought some at the, at the Duty Free. Uh, they're all very interesting, very different. Every single one is very different. Um, one of the things I do want to address though, for those of you who are trying to explain what Coquito is to your Anglo friends, please, please, please do not say it is Puerto Rican eggnog because it's not made with eggs. I mean, there are some variations that are made with eggs, but for the most part, Coquito is not made with eggs, so it's not eggnog at no, all. No, and there, there's a controversy because there are some families who do include eggs, right? Yes, Arecibo, Arecibo is one of those places. That so has if you variations. do include eggs in it, know that your shelf life in your fridge is going to be much shorter. So um, that's a, you know, a culinary tip for you. So I added one can of coconut milk, full fat. Don't ever go light on me, folk. This is not the time, okay? <laughs> we have, I'm gonna put the whole can of evaporated condensed milk. Now the difference between this one and the other milk evaporated is that this one has sugar in it, right? Evaporated milk is actually milk that has the water that has been removed. That's why it's been called evaporated milk. Actually, about 60% of evaporated milk. If my friend Mario Bosquez is in the audience, if he watches this video, yes, we learned, Mario, that evaporated milk or condensed milk do spoil. So even yeah. if you put it in your fridge, they have a shelf life. <laughs> Yesenia, can, you, can you plug Mario's uh, podcast real quick? Yes, run the dish. Run the dish. He has an amazing uh, food, lifestyle, and other kitchen witchery. Um, and uh, I have been in his podcast a couple of times talking about recipes, my travels. He's just an amazing person to follow and definitely listen to his podcast. <laughs> And for those of you who remember Mario Bosquez, Mario Bosquez is a very popular TV anchor in New York City for many, many years. He has an incredible career in journalism, but he's multi-talented. So check out the podcast when you get a chance. Yes, I watch the dish. I watch. And it's on Apple. It's, a, it's, it's all over. So I think it's linked in my, in my website, too. Maybe we'll add a link later. So here I Absolutely. added the cream of coconut. This is very sweet. Use a spoon or a spatula to take it out. Yes, use your fingers, you're at home, no one's watching. Well, you're watching me, I'm not watching you. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> if you feel like tasting it, it is one of the most delicious things in the world. I love coconut. I am a huge fan of coconut. So try to take everything out. So all we're doing is we're prepping the rest of the milk while the other milk cools down. Now, if you steep that milk with the spices for like an hour, it's gonna be really, really, really flavorful. But if you really want to enhance, also if you love spices, there are people who put ginger in it. I don't really love ginger um, in certain recipes, so I omitted it. But if you love the spices, you can just put it also in your mixture or do a garnish like I did. All my milk's in there and a teaspoon of vanilla or two. I love vanilla extract, okay? Did you know that this cap is actually a teaspoon measurement? Really? Yeah. I was today years old. <laughs> All right. So I know that there are some people who also blend and they grate their own coconut and they make their own coconut milk. And you know, they really, really take the time to do this because it's a very important recipe in their family. I don't have time for that. A lot of us don't have time for that. So definitely pick a brand of coconut products that you enjoy. Make sure your blender is tight. Okay, 
So that's that. Um, I'm gonna give it a couple of seconds again. My milk is slightly cool. Now you see there's like this little telita, like a little film that forms on top of um, on top of warm milk. You can just remove that. Don't forget to have, when you cook, my Rachel Ray bowl, okay? I learned this tip from Rachel Ray is to have a bowl next to you for garbage. Definitely keeps you organized. So my milk is slightly cool. Any questions from anyone? I know Jordana is doing this along with me and I know Janice got the recipe or anyone want to talk about variations. Uh, pistachio is a flavor that a lot of people love. Now pistachio, you, you can do two things. Make a paste, you need a paste from the pistachio nut, but you need to blanch those nuts, make a paste, or buy it from Amazon, it costs about $12. Um, or honestly, you could use pistachio ice cream. So that's that's a like a really good ice cream. It's a good way of making pistachio. If you wanna make it Nutella, um, about a cup of Nutella, right? Pumpkin puree, there's so many different kinds of coquito, but this is the basic recipe and then you can enhance it and make it yours. Chocolate mint peanut yeah. butter i've heard peanut butter oh peanut butter imagine peanut butter and chocolate and coconut like well, I, I don't like peanut butter personally but i know a lot of people who love 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 peanut butter coquito actually um it was cynthia from flaco coquito that made peanut butter coquito at capicu ah so wow. Nicole asked, um when do you add in the um extra flavor do you add it in now if you were to do the extra flavor, yeah, you add it after you add all your milks, you blend it. It depends on what you're using though. Like if you're using a paste, you may need to blend it a little longer than like a minute. However, don't over blend your coquito because what's gonna happen is you're gonna whip the fat in the coconut and you're gonna make whipped coconut. It's happened to me. I'm only sharing these tips because I have made that mistake. <laughs> so our coquito is still in the blender. This is cooling. Okay, I'm gonna walk you through the next recipe, okay? You need, because I know people are at home and so I want them to kind of prep for the next step. We have, we're gonna make empanadas, pastelillos, pastelitos. Whatever you want to call them, they're just Panadilla. delicious pockets <laughs> of yumminess, right? Turnovers. In El Salvador, um, Central America, there's different doughs. We use actually maseca. We use corn masa. We flare it with salt and achote and anato, and we make masa like tortillas, and we hand press like tortillas, little discs, and we fry them. That's how we make our empanadas. We call them empanadas. But the word empanada actually comes from Spain. So this is from our Spanish ancestry. Now, what goes in it is not necessarily from our Spanish ancestry. It's from our local and native ingredients. And that's why everybody has a different kind of empanada in what they use. The word empanada comes from the word empanar, which means bread. That's why it has different names. The word pastelito, which for example, Haitian people call it like pastis, I believe, or pates, right? Pastito, pate, yeah. Ja Jamaican, they have their own kind of pate, patties, and it's because it comes from the word pasti, which is pastry. So yeah. they use pastry dough, and they also use puff pastry. So when you think about who came to our lands, right? The Spanish or the French, that's why we have so many different variations and we bake them or we fry them. We have different folds, different ingredients. So I just wanted to talk to you about that. And it's okay, be proud of it. Every family has their own, you know, it's kind of like pupusas. I'm from El Salvador. My family makes the best pupusas, right? <laughs> Your family makes the best empanadas. So for ingredients, we're gonna use, I'm gonna use ground beef, but you can make um, this with, I'm gonna make a picadillo, which is like chopped minced ingredients because it's really easy. You can use ground chicken. 
I'm gonna use half of a red pepper and about three tablespoons of onion. I'm gonna use two minced garlic cloves, about half a cup of tomato sauce. And for my spices, cause I'm making kind of like a Caribbean style picadillo is paprika, dry oregano, cumin, this is cumin, this is garlic powder, salt and pepper. I'm gonna make it a little dry because I don't want my empanada this, you know, to open up and I'm gonna fry them. But if anyone wants to bake them, I would turn on my oven to 400 degrees and you're gonna bake them for about 15 to 20 minutes. Use baking spray and you're gonna put them separate, okay? So, so that's uh, what Emily, um, we're gonna do I'm next. sorry, Yesenia. So Emily um, said that she pops them in the air fryer. Do you have any tips for people who use air fryers to make a healthier version of, of these? Um, You know, she's the second person that has told me about these air fryer empanadas. Um, Just seal them really tight. And I still would use a little bit of oil. I think every air fryer is different because there are air fryers that you can actually bake them. And then there's air fryers that like they go in a like in a pocket yeah right um they're healthy i would just bake them if that's another option that you have got it okay so let's go back to our coquito because i want to finish this recipe put it in the fridge so you can drink it i am going to i'm trying not to go too fast because i know that there are some folk who are cooking who are making this Okay, you need a strainer. Maybe I'm gonna put this in a bowl. I don't want this to spill all over and then I'm gonna be really, really upset. So I'm gonna strain it into a bowl and then put it in my blender. I foresaw an accident happening. Okay. Again, if you have the time, but because we're doing this live and it's a cooking class, if you have the time to leave this steeping for about an hour, do so. All right, so now I'm gonna put it in my blender. And let's not forget the last but not least really important ingredient. And this is also controversial because Latinos are always controversial. Is how much rum do you put in your coquito? <laughs> I'm gonna add a cup. I'm gonna add a full cup. I like to taste my coconut. There are some people who feel like they want to taste more of the rum than the coconut, right? I have family members that actually add coquito to their rum. I mean, you know. <laughs> I have a friend, my friend Lily, who uses rum and she also uses the cinnamon the cork. Fireball. So that's really, 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 really potent coquito. It is delicious though. All right. So cover, add your rum. I'm gonna leave that up to you. If you wanna add more, if you wanna add coquito to your rum. <laughs> Any fun Big comments tip. you wanna share? For those, of you, for those of you who are making these for your family gatherings, please make sure that you properly label the virgin coquito for the children. We do not need the kids running around. <laughs> Wait, are we making virgin version? I don't know. I mean. <laughs> For kids? Yes, I would. I mean, I always did. <laughs> my, I'm going to do this, George, and you're going to entertain everyone. I'm going to mute my mic for about 30 seconds, okay? Actually, because we'll I don't want to hurt everyone's break. ear. I'm just going to blend this. We'll go to a commercial break while you're doing that real quick. Go, go. Exactly. Blend your coquito, yeah. everyone. Right now.
So really quick, I just want to let you know that tonight wouldn't be possible without our sponsors. Our sponsors tonight are Capicu Culture, obviously Chef Jesenia, who is here donating her time uh, to bring some holiday cheer to everybody. Um, this is a Siembra Academy production by Sofrito Media Group. Uh, who else do we have to give shout outs to? We have to give shout outs to Flaco Coquito for their beautiful version of Coquito that is actually in liquor stores in certain parts of the country. So definitely check that out. Um, who else? Who else? Um, big shout out to my partner, Papo Swiggity, who's watching on the check-in. Um, yeah, just some, we just really, really want to be able to celebrate the holidays uh, to the utmost. A lot of you are gathering with your families for the very first time. I will tell you that um, this year uh, coming up, we are actually celebrating our 25th anniversary for SofritoForYourSoul.com. That's right. I started this website in 1997. Um, so I do want you to know that what it said in the commercial I just played is 100% accurate. I want to give the website back to the community. I want your short stories, your poems, your recipes. I want you to donate content to the Web, the website so that people can learn from you we want to expand we don't want to be so caribbean centric we want salvadoreños we want guatemaltecos we want colombianos we want costarricenses we want hondureños we want everybody we want afro-colombianos we want brazilians haitian whoever wants to contribute and uh, and share their stories with us we are open to that so Definitely consider contributing your piece of sofrito to the community today. And we're going to go back to Chef Jesenia. Boom. We are back. Yes, we are back. So here I have my coquito. You know what I realized, George? Because this is live, right? That I didn't include my cinnamon sticks in my spice milk. So um, what happens if you do that? Well, I have ground cinnamon right and i'm just gonna add it directly to my coquito because i well in terms of ground dry uh cinnamon it's really potent um and sometimes it goes all the way to the bottom right so before you serve your coquito you are going to shake it so i'm just gonna put this back in my blender for like two seconds i know that cole is probably beating her not beating she's mixing <laughs> her coquito and that's all i needed um she's mixing her coquito so definitely make sure that you get all those chunks of cream of coconut my Container also dressed up today. Gonna pour it in. Now this serves about, I think about 10 glasses, depending on what glass you, you use. I have a big one. Hey, Janice wants to know. <laughs> this is Janice just for me. My boyfriend has another. So Janice wants to know what's the difference in flavor between light and dark rum? So dark rum has been aged longer, right? And has been, uh, so the sugars are much more concentrated. And to me, to me, dark rum has a more richer and smoother taste, which is why I personally enjoy it. Light rum, I think has been aged a year maximum, right? For aged dark rum, two years. And you're gonna start seeing the word añejo Añejo means, I think that it's been um, aged at least, you see seven years, 10 years. Yeah. When you go to the Bacardi factory in Puerto Rico, you can taste like all the different kinds of, of aged, depending on how many years they, they've been aged. And they just make a world of difference. And I actually prefer gold, Bacardi gold, Bacardi seven, Añejo. And then there's one that's like 150 proof, which is like also very delicious. Absolutely. And, and for those of you who don't know, when you go to the Bacardi factory in Puerto Rico, you have an opportunity to actually seal your own bottle and wax, put the wax on it, have it sealed and certified. And then they'll actually etch your name in glass, in the glass. 
Oh wow! I haven't been in a couple it's of like years. It's like thirty. It's like thirty bucks, and they they give you this whole case for it. It has your name on it. You get a certificate. They register it on the barrels with like they have serial numbers for every bottle they ever created. Um, so it's a very cool experience if you ever go down there to actually right. do that. Right. Yes, I highly recommend it. It used to be free. Okay, so this baby can now go in your fridge. So for tasting it, um, my glass is in the freezer because I want to have a glass in, 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 you know, 30 minutes. Um, you need to take it out at least an hour before you serve it to your family or friends because you need that coconut fat to kind of like come to room temperature slightly. If not, it's going to be really, really thick. So that's a serving tip from me. Anyone want to share any tips? Feel free to write in the chat or in the comments. Like, what do you do? Something special that you do? I love to hear people's stories. It's not just about me, right? Or George, although we could talk for days about everything. But I love to hear what you do for your family, for your kids, for your grandma. Like, do you adjust the sugar and stuff like that? I just want to know where you got that little bottle wrap. What did you say? I want to know where you got the bottle wrap. Repeat that. I said, I want to know where you got that bottle wrap. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I think someone gave it to me for like a wine glass. And I was like, oh, this goes great for my cookie. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I'm trying to find, I, I have it. a cookie bottle in there. I need to make room for this. <laughs> All right, so moving on, right? Let's get rid of all our coquito stuff. I didn't taste the coquito because I know it's really good, but if you guys want to taste it, even though it's a little warm, go ahead. I give you permission. I don't believe you. I'll be home tomorrow. I have to test it for myself. <laughs> I just don't believe you. I don't. I, I What's your do recipe, George? So, you know what? I've always done it like similar to what you're doing right now. Um, like I said, I, I use Hennessy White. I've used Pitorro extensively. I stopped using rum a long time ago. Um, but my, my favorites are, are the Hennessy and the, uh, and, the, um, and the Pitorro version. Now, I did promise everybody that I, at the conclusion of your Coquito recipe, I was going to share a tip. So if you leave the last little 5% of coquito left over in the bottle, the one that has all the sediment, with all the spices and the cinnamon and everything. What I like to do with it is I like to make French toast with it. Oh. It's a resaca recipe that I've been using for years. So I take that and I'll actually dip some challah bread and make French toast and French and French toast sticks for some boozy, uh, for some boozy pancakes and French toast. Oh my God, that sounds amazing. So that's my tip. That's my that's my ace. Everybody loves it. I think I'm gonna make coquito French toast, coquito pancakes. <laughs> like, yes. What else can you make, right? Everything. That's so good. Thank you for that. Um, so we're gonna move over now to the empanadas. Is there anything you want to play or you want to share? Um, I'll just play a quick commercial while you do the transition. It's a short one, but um, as many of you know, I own an agency in New York called Sofrito Media Group, uh, and we have a, a, an initiative called Siembra, which Jesenia is a part of, and so is Jessica from The Dining Traveler. Um, so I have quite a few uh, uh, chefs, so when we have our first in-person holiday dinner, I know who to, I know who to call. Um, Sambra Initiative was a program that I started in the beginning of the pandemic uh, to be able to help people that were trying to pivot. Um, some people lost their jobs and they were looking to find out what the next big thing was going to be when the pandemic started. Um, so we got together. It was like 50 people when we started uh, in this Facebook group. And I started sharing all my social media expertise. We started talking about branding. We started doing certain exercises to get people thinking differently about their businesses. And the group has grown now to about 220 people. We had one uh, professional VIP cohort last year, and we're about to start the second one in January. Um, so if you're interested in Siembra Initiative, hit me up in the DM. Um, we're gonna be opening up. Um, I'm gonna let people in, anybody who's in this class right now, 
If you mention this class, you get in for free. Once January 1st rolls around, even the Facebook group is going to have a fee attached to it. Uh, we have to make it sustainable and we give a lot, a lot of good stuff away in that group. So um, we're going to have a modest uh, fee. It's going to be $120 a month. The first two weeks of January, it's going to be down to $99. So $99 for the whole year. You get social media classes. You get some one-on-ones. I do like live fireside chats. I mean, Arsenia, you can tell people what, what your experience has been, but um, a lot of people have really, um, they've done a lot with their businesses ever since becoming part of the group. And it's because they help each other. Uh, it's more than just me teaching. It's everybody connecting. You connected with Jessica and that's been a great synergy. Um, I've worked with Jessica a couple of times. She's amazing. Um, there's just so many people. There's people who have quit their jobs. Uh, once they got back to work, they actually quit their jobs to do their businesses full time. Uh, so there's a lot of magic happening in Siembra. So I just wanted to like, you know, plug that really quick because it's something I don't talk about enough in these, in these forums. That's why I asked. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to play a quick um, commercial while you transition, okay? Yeah, that was a, you're going to what? Commercial? Okay. Yeah, quick commercial. So... There you have it. <laughs> that was a great transition. It actually gave everyone time to get their recipe and ingredients for the empanadas, okay? So let's start with that, okay? You're going to need um, two pans. You're going to need two pans. One is to make the picadillo and one is to fry. You're also going to need a tray or a plate where you can put your pre your uh, raw empanadas, meaning like then you're gonna fry them or you're gonna put them in the oven, right? So I said heat your oven to 400 degrees. So that's what you need. Right now we are going to do something that's called browning our meats, our ground beef, our ground turkey, our ground chicken. A lot of people ask me about pans. And there's a lot of really good, very expensive pans, but this is the cheapest pan you can get for yourself and it's gonna last you a lifetime. It is a cast iron, okay? The only thing is that it's a little hard to maintain it. You have to cure it all the time. You have to season it. Uh, you don't wash it with soap. You wash it with salt, hot water, and you scrub it with like, um, you can scrub with regular scrub, but I scrub it with a eye with a metal, right? Or steel scrub. And then you put it away. You put some some oil at the bottom and always keep it moist. So here I'm using grapeseed oil. It's one of the healthiest oils that I've worked with so far. It's made out of yes, grape seeds. So it has all the vitamins and benefits of grapeseed oil. So that means it has a lot of vitamin E. You're gonna need a spatula or, or, a, um, or a spoon. So get your, get your ground beef out or ground turkey. So we're making Caribbean style picadillo. This is actually actually made also all over Latin America with different ingredients. Um, the Cuban version adds potatoes and yes. they add raisins. So it's a sweet and savory. Um, Puerto Rican, I believe also adds carrots, red pepper. Dominican also have a different variation. Some people add cilantro, some people don't. Some people add capers, some people add olives. Um, in El Salvador, added, we I've also- I've calabaza. Which one? I've, calabaza. I've done picadillo with calabaza. With calabaza, oh, that's like a sweet, right? Yes, very, oh, very sweet. Oh, that sounds delicious. Um, so add potato if you want to starch, add a healthier uh, starch like a calabaza, which is pumpkin for English speakers only. <laughs> so here 
after I heated about two tablespoons of grapeseed oil. Now I'm using sirloin and it doesn't have a lot of fat. It's a lean cut of ground beef. But if yours renders a lot of fat, you may need to drain the fat out, okay? So let's add our beef. So here's a recipe where we're gonna be multitasking. We are going to brown our beef and then we're gonna go and chop the rest of our ingredients. So I have taught a picadillo class before and we make it with white rice and we also add some maduro. So we do a whole, whole plate. But I like this recipe for empanadas or pastelillos because um, a, your filling has to be cooked, fully cooked. So this recipe is already fully cooked, has a lot of different flavors, and it stays in the dough really well. Let's take out our discs also from the fridge. I hope you thaw them out. If you didn't thaw them, um, I have used the microwave in like spurts of 15 seconds to get them to to thaw out okay but you got to be really really careful i have used the water method i would say don't use that method the water gets into your disc um there's lots of things that i have tried but just taking them out about an hour before you need them really works i'm gonna use the pastry dough now they come in different brands there's la fe la flor um there's goya i I'm not a big brand person. I always tell people use what you're comfortable with, politically, um, flavor, you know. And um, you can make your own pastry this, but I'm going to tell you it takes about an hour and a half and a lot of effort. So if you have the time again, like go ahead and do it. Leilita.com has a great recipe on there that I have tried, but you have to roll out and every disc has to be the same thickness. So for $2, frozen section yeah. of the supermarket. <laughs> I have a question, Yesenia. How, I've always fantasized with making pastelillos with filo dough. Have you ever done anything like that? With which one? Filo dough. Yes. So. Um, I have made it with filo dough, but a filo dough has a lot of butter. So I would uh, suggest to bake those. Okay. We have made also very uh, sweet empanadas in my classes and filo dough works really well for that. But also only use about three sheets, three to four sheets tops. Because otherwise, okay. it's, yeah, it's too, too thick. Pastry dough, paste, no, puff pastry which is what Haitian culture actually uses to make their patties. And they have mm. like curried fish, curried chicken. So yes, um, actually, if you ever, if you ever stop in the, uh, in the airport in Port-au-Prince, that's the first thing that you smell when you get off the plane is their, is their pastries, their, their, right? their, patties, their beef patties. Um, oh they my gosh. Fish, Colombian seafood, culture, they country. use a different kind of um, dough think they use cornmeal and theirs is really, really crunchy. So for yeah. now, I'm just going to brown this, but I don't have to stand next to the stove. We're gonna go to our prep table, lower your heat to low, okay? So that it doesn't burn, we wanna brown it. What browning in chef culinary terms means you're adding flavor. Anytime that you brown your meats, you sear your meats, all of that brown is flavor. It's the fat, it's the sugars, it's a chemical reaction, right? That happens when, when we do that and that's what we want. Sometimes we add a little wine and we scrape off all those browning bits. So always brown your meats before, even if you're making like a pasta sauce or something like that. So. I think you can see my board. I can see that you can see my board. So we are going to chop our onions. I am going to only use about three tablespoons of onion. I want you to chop it really small. 
there's many ways of chopping an onion, but the way I like to do it, I like to teach it. If you see these little lines on the onion, go down those lines. Nature does it easy for you. Okay. I like to use white Spanish onion because it's sweet. There is a difference in flavor in white or yellow, the dahlia, red onion. This one tends to be sweeter. So I already went down the lines of the onion and then I go across. It's kind of forming a graph. And then I cut down and I mince pretty much dice my onion. All right, my knife is too small for the onion, but it'll work. All right, so you only need about three tablespoons. I said one fourth, right? Okay, so if anyone's doing that along with me, you're gonna add that to a bowl. Make sure everything is chopped. See how fast that was? And I'm not even going fast. I'm not doing the, you know, because I know that there's people who are cooking with me. I like to go at everyone's pace. So, onion and now i'm gonna cut the pepper the pepper also small dice use my handy garbage bowl okay take out all the seeds and i'm only gonna use about half i like to cut my pepper in strips What is your favorite empanada, George? You know, I like beef and cheese mixed. Cheese? Beef and cheese. Ah, beef yeah. and cheese. Okay. And so, then um, chicken and avocado is my second. Ooh. Those are the my version. Chicken avocado. Ooh. And I got the idea from California Pizza Kitchen because they do like a chicken avocado egg roll. Yes. And, and I was just like, well, what if I make it as a pasta? You know, a pastelillo. And I, oh, yeah. that's such so, a great idea. I just think that I need to do it in in my in my air fryer instead or baked instead of uh fried. I don't have an air fryer, and I feel like I I'm love my air to fryer. Get one. My friend Brendali bought me an air fryer as a housewarming gift for my new apartment, and I'm gonna tell you, like, I my life is completely changed. Like the only thing that I can do in there is fry ice cream Mexican style, but other than that, I could do anything, and it's so evenly cooked. It's like it's almost, it's like a crock pot for fried stuff. Right. It's the best way I could describe it. Oh my God. It's like everyone has an air fryer nowadays. I have a client who has an air fryer, but they have the one that's like an oven. It's a little bit yeah. more, uh, it's bigger, but it's really amazing. You can roll I'm gonna tell you right now. There. I'm going to tell you right now, my girlfriend makes amazing, amazing, amazing food in the air fryer all the time. Like she's she's really dope with the air fryer skills. Hmm. So I gotta I gotta learn how to I know yeah I gotta figure out how to uh to expand my expertise in that regard. But yeah, I'm I'm learning. <laughs> I believe that they're air fryer cookbooks that people use, right? I don't know if anyone's still chopping, but here's my red pepper and onion. And I'm going to add that to my beef. Now, you can either mince your garlic, you can use your gadget to mince your garlic. You can use a grater, like a box grater to grate your garlic, whatever is easier for you, no judgment. You know, we're, we are 
Sometimes we're so busy to cook that we don't make recipes because it takes forever. Some people actually buy pre-minced garlic. That's okay. No judgment. Um, Whatever works. Yeah. So here is my beef. This is what it looks like. Okay. That's going to cook down. Now I'm going to mince my my garlic. Now, the only thing I want to point out is that any filling that you, you put into your empanadas has to be cooked because it takes a few minutes for the dough to cook or fry to bake. So definitely um, pre-cook your filling or just make cheese. And, you know, I realized that I left my... I was sharpening it and I left it in the living room. But I have this other knife. So when it comes to garlic, you literally just press it down and then you peel it. I have a big mama jama garlic here. Now garlic is really healthy for us. And so I'm gonna just use one clove because this looks like two, it's, it's humongous. Um, it is really, it is, full of health benefits, right? Um, if you want to enhance the benefits of garlic, you can leave it out for about 10 minutes and it will be, it's gonna even smell more garlicky. I love roasted garlic. I love using raw garlic in salad dressings. I use it in all my cooking. If there's no garlic in my food, I feel like it's missing something. <laughs> okay, so quickly mincing. And I wanted to make sure that it's nicely minced because I don't want big chunks of garlic. Bite into big chunks of garlic. So this is ready. I'm gonna add that to my beef. I'm also gonna add now all the spices and I'm gonna add my tomato sauce. When you make picadillo, you can actually use wine to make picadillo, um, make it a little fancy. Use white wine and you add a little bit of water because you want your picadillo to be saucy. But this picadillo needs to be a little dry because if it's too wet, it's going to come out of the empanadas. So I'm going to add my garlic. And my tomato sauce. Actually, let me add my spices first. I don't add adobo. I know, I know people are gonna say that's controversial. I don't add adobo. I stopped using adobo. Uh, I mix my own adobo. Adobo is only cumin, paprika, achote, garlic powder, onion powder, oregano, salt and pepper, and turmeric. And, and the reason why you don't use adobo is because of the MSG, correct? Because of the salt and all the preservative, the MSG, you know, all that stuff. It's, it, and the thing is, Goya has branded it as their own adobo, but adobo is actually any seasoning. It's the same thing as curry. Curry is a blend of seasonings. Read the label of your sazon, and you can make your own George Torres sazon and sell it, right? <laughs> So what I do is I season all my food with the spices individually. And that way I can adjust what I like, right? All right, so this meat, you need to actually 
break down the chunks. And I have a moment to show you this. Christmas calories don't count. <laughs> they don't count. They don't. It's like daylight savings time. You got to go like you, you You turn the scale back a couple of pounds. <laughs> it's daylight savings time. So let's add our spices. In my recipe card, I said one teaspoon of everything. That's always my secret. One teaspoon. Then you can adjust it for more. The only thing that I said half a teaspoon is cumin. A lot of people don't love cumin. It could be a very strong spice. Start with half a teaspoon and add a little more. Coriander, it's also like a really great spice for this. Coriander is the seeds of cilantro. Oh. It's really interesting. People think cilantro is Latin American. It's not. It's actually Asian and Indian. Asian, yeah. It came from that part of the world, but we had adopted it and we, we put it in everything. Right? You can tell I'm eyeballing. The only thing that happens to spices when they don't have all of that preservative stuff is this is what happens. It dries out, right? Doesn't mean it's bad, but just kind of have to like work it. But that's what yeah. adobo has. Adobo has all that extra stuff so that it doesn't cake. So it doesn't clump up, yeah. Yeah, when you buy organic and things like that, they clump up. Sometimes um, someone has to, uh, some people have told me to add like rice in the shaker so that, you know, oh, that, that makes it sense. clumps, yeah. So I have about a teaspoon of garlic powder, a teaspoon of dry oregano, a teaspoon of paprika. Paprika is not spicy, it is very sweet. And I'm gonna add only half a teaspoon of salt because I am actually going to add some capers. I know in the recipe it said to add some uh, chopped or some manzanilla um, olives, but capers is a good substitution for olives. And olives is totally optional as well. These are really salty because they sit in a brine. So I taste it for salt after I add all of my ingredients and then I adjust the salt. So now I'm gonna add the tomato sauce. You know the Goya brand sauce? What it has and a lot of people don't realize is that you can also make your own sauce. It has carrots, it has carrots and celery. So when you go out and you buy the, like the tomato sauce, it's missing those ingredients. And that's why people are like, well, I taste something different, you know? I love to read ingredients on cans and stuff like that because I like to make my own. We don't love Goya around here. <laughs> <laughs> so here is my picadillo. All right, you know, we're almost done. And I know it's 10, almost 10 o'clock here. So just break these clumps. This is almost done because I'm not gonna simmer it the way you do picadillo. You, you simmer picadillo for like 30 minutes more so that all the flavors can combine and it has to be a bit saucy. Gonna break up those clumps. I don't want it too clumpy. I'm gonna taste it. And then I'm going to remove it from the pan and I'm going to add the cheese into it. That looks amazing. I like doing close ups of food. I, I know people like me, but they like food better. <laughs> I mean, no offense, you're cool, but. Uh... <laughs> this is like a close up. Everyone loves close ups of food something I've learned along the way. All right, so while this cooks, I'm gonna cook it for about three more minutes. I'm gonna take out my empanada disc. Make sure your board is clean and then you need a, a, a tray. You need a tray or a plate so you can, you need a fork, okay? my spices over 
over here. Let me take out my this. So I want to tell you Siembra, what Siembra has done for me. What Siembra has done for me, it has, it's not just Siembra, it's really George, because George is Siembra, right? Um, I was always, the fact that I'm doing this live is like, a miracle right I was the kind of chef that I was just George has been on me to do videos forever for at least six years <laughs> and I just wasn't doing it I was like it's not me like I'm not it I don't want to be in the public eye like that's just not the kind of chef I want to be and um, when COVID shutdown happened I joined Sandra and um, and it changed my life. It really changed my life. He started giving us tips on how to like, I didn't even know how to get on camera, what Zoom was, like I didn't know any of that. You know, I've been in the kitchen for six years already and you kind of forget all that stuff. And so I didn't even know I could do um, a business Instagram. Like you were like, create your business Instagram, create your, take pictures, <laughs> get a logo. You know, and I was in marketing for a long time, but we forget to do these things for yourself. So you really have changed my life. You added a lot of business for me um, through this kind of exposure. So this is like amazing that we're even doing this, right? Um, and the fact that I'm in my kitchen and like I'm sharing all of this information. And um, I may, you know, I don't know where this is going to go, but I really do thank you for that. And I know you have a whole bunch of different kinds of people, um, services, ser companies are under Siembra, but as a chef, you have been tremendous as my friend too, but you took it to a different level for me, for sure. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> so Bye. here like this, they come um, in these little you know, with these little films so that they don't stick together. They're actually perfect. I bought two packs just because I wasn't sure if sometimes they're frozen. People in the supermarket take them out and they leave them out and they defrost in a really bad way. So my picadillo is done. Taste it for salt and pepper. I may add a little bit more pepper. Taste it for salt. That's perfect. Break down those clumps. Now it's really hot. So, because we're doing this live, I am going to put it in a bowl so that it cools. Because I'm working with a hot ingredient, it's going to also affect the way my pastry dough works. So if you have time, you can let it cool. You can also make your empanadas and freeze them uh, you put them on a tray and then you put them in the freezer and they will last forever in your freezer but don't fry them leave them raw or uncooked unfried and um and then you put them in a ziploc bag together and they won't stick but you gotta freeze them first so i'm gonna add my cheese directly to the picadillo now, if I lost many of you because you're following the recipe and something happened, just go back to the recipe card. The way my recipes are written are not in traditional recipe. Um, the way you would pick it up like from you, the, from like Google or like a cookbook. I actually write my recipes the way I want you to cook it, the way I want you to make it. So I do step one, step two, step three. Okay, as if you have me in your kitchen guiding you. So 
Hopefully you can jump right back in by looking at the card. So here's, I have my cheese. Some people don't mix their cheese in, but I like to because that way it's already melted and worked in, okay? So that's my picadillo filling. All right. Yesenia. Put it aside, it's a little warm. Yesenia, Check we have that. a question. We have a question in the chat. Um, Jennifer C. Fuentes asked, do you prefer a particular type of salt? We know a lot oh. of people have issues with hypertension and they have alternative versions of salt. Is there any particular one you prefer? Yes, um, two types. Himalayan salt, which is the one I'm using tonight. It's a pink salt. It actually does pink come salt, from yeah. the Himalayan mountains, um, from the India, India, somewhere over there. And it's a little bit pricey, but pricey in comparison to table salt. I no longer use table salt uh, ever. Like I just took that out of my diet. It is, um, unless you need certain kind of, uh, what does it have, iodine, I think. Unless you have some thyroid issues and you need iodine, then I, you just don't use it. Um, sea salt, um, Norton's makes a really good sea salt now and it is like a dollar. And I'm taking you to my cupboard. Um, I use this natural sea salt. So sea salt what about is garlic amazing. Salt? Huh? How about garlic salt? So then you have to read whether it's a sea salt or not, right? So okay. the idea is to use natural salts that haven't been bleached. Got it. Okay. Um, because or because they add chemicals. So you need to, especially for hypertension, um, what I've heard is like, we don't eat so much salt, right? Unless you eat like out all the time. Um, kosher salt, kosher salt just means that it's kosher. It means a rabbi actually blessed it, something like that. But it doesn't have any really health benefits like Himalayan and sea salt. Got it. Thank you so much. That was a great question. Okay, so next steps, everyone. You need a frying pan. You need vegetable oil unless you're going to be baking them or if you are going to um, put them in your air fryer. I am interested in knowing how those air fryer empanadas come out. I'm going to be honest. Like I said, I don't own one. The one that you put in the pot, you know what I'm talking about? Like it has like yeah. a a yep. drawer. I have a tray. I have like a tray with a little like a uh, fire basket inside, and uh, it kind of drains out whatever. You but know, it needs a little oil, oil, right? No, nothing. Before empanadas, because I feel like the empanadas. Nothing. Nothing. Okay. Nothing. I mean, uh, I know a couple of people mentioned that they like um, air fryers. I know Jennifer Cifuentes. I think Nicole said something, and also Emily. Um, do you put oil in it? I don't. I was told not to I, because I think it's a fire hazard in some Stop. of the you know. really. I have a friend who puts oil, a little bit of oil. In her hair. I mean, I mean, you could coat, you can coat the fryer basket so nothing sticks. Uh, and, if you're, and if you're cooking, and if you're doing raw meats, if you're doing your picadillo, for example, in an air fryer, then then the natural oil, you know, the natural right. fat will 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 lubricate it. But yeah. You can spray well, something. Well, air fryer is actually food. like a small convection oven. That's what it really is. Yeah, it's it's a it, but it cooks very evenly, which is what the, the 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 thing is. Like if you do fried chicken, you don't have to worry about really turning it around too much. If you spread them out properly, like they'll cook evenly all the way across. So Emily says you could spray something on the base, like Pam spray, like so it's like a cooking spray. That's what I thought. Just because, let me tell you why. And this is maybe just me working it in my head. Um, when you bake empanada dough, and for me, because I'm a chef, I love everything with flavor. And I just feel like sometimes you can do little things to enhance flavor. You can eat healthy, but it doesn't mean you're, you know, you're not frying it. But, um, when you bake the empanadas, for example, now they're selling empanada dough that's for baking. Oh my God, I tried it the other time, the other day, last week. They are so hard. 
And I'm just like, I'm just not gonna eat them. I actually threw out like eight empanadas. It just was not my preference, you know? Um, so that that's, that's why I'm asking. So for these, you can stretch them a little bit with your hand, put them on your board. I'm gonna make sure that they can see what's happening here. That's for people who haven't made empanadas. And again, I'm using the pastry dough. Salvador and empanadas is completely different process, like I said. So I'm gonna grab a spoon, but you need a fork. You need a fork. Um, there's a company called Empanada Fork. Yes. That I have worked with, that we did a raffle last year. And they have sort of like a stamp and like fork teeth to do what we're gonna do right now. So I just got mine in the mail. I literally just got it two days ago. Ah, uh, from I want you to try it. <laughs> yes. I have but a because couple not of Because everybody empanadas. has an empanada fork, I'm, I'm showing it this way. Old school, right? old school. So you have your disc, you're gonna put it on the right side, or if you're a lefty, on the left side, but you're gonna pre cut it in half in your mind, right? And you're gonna put it on the right side about one and a half tablespoon, no more than that. I have my kids because I teach elementary and I teach high school and all these kids. I like stuffing the empanada with so much filling and then they can't close it. You want it to close, you want it to seal, okay? And all of this filling is actually gonna spread throughout. Then you fold it over, you can press it with your hands, your fingers, and you're gonna use this lovely gadget and you're gonna press down and seal it. Be gentle, and you're gonna go around. So what the empanada fork does is that it like stamps it down closed. So Jesenia, while you're doing that, can you tell people what the biggest mistakes people make when they're actually creating their, like when they're actually sealing them? I know somebody mentioned using really wet, um, like, not not draining out the meat properly is a big faux pas. Like what what other things can people do to really like destroy the consistency of the uh, empanada or patalillo? So you have to make sure you seal it on the corners, right? You can flip it over and you can seal it on both sides. Make sure your dough is not super soft. If for some reason your dough is like starting to stretch too much, put it back in the freezer or in the fridge for a few minutes because this has fat. Make sure your filling isn't watery, isn't too watery. Make sure you don't rip also your dough. So those are the biggest mistakes and overfilling it is like, again, that's what people, people think it needs to be really stuffed and it doesn't. Don't use water for this specific I know wonton wraps or like egg rolls, you need water to seal it. You don't need water for this dough. There's stuff. also fun, um, when I went to Argentina, Argentinian empanadas are very different and we made our own dough. And um, the way they, they seal their empanadas are with folds to show the filling. Is it meat, is it vegetarian? or is it, you know, just cheese? They do different folds for the different kinds of empanadas. Okay, so we are going to make, what I do also is I put like four discs on my board and I do it quickly. So this is what I'm using my tray for. Now let's talk fillings, right? You were talking about uh, chicken and avocado. I wanna hear if anyone puts in the chat, watching this video, what fillings are popular in your family or maybe what filling you wanna try. 
interesting things that you've had. I've had guava and cheese. Oh, that's a classic. Yeah, guava and cheese. I've had it actually. The the people that make it in the airport in San Juan, there's a little there's a little shop, a little a little criollo spot in in the in the airport. And every time I have like a quick layover and we're just like turning over the plane, I just run over there real quick to go pick up one of those. Oh, so I good. like anything with guava actually. <laughs> You can use any jam, right? Any jam, like mango jam. I've never, I've never done it. Um, I just, I've, I've had it in a couple of different pastry spots, and I'm not big on pastries, but that's one. Anything with guava in it, I'll definitely try. At least you know once. what we we did with my class last week, a couple of weeks ago, we did um, apple pie empanadas. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah, so we made our apple pie filling, and then we used this dough. And we baked them, so that's another idea. So, Jesenia, real quick, while you're doing that, um, can you talk a little bit about some of the corporate functions you've been doing lately and how people could book you? I put information up on how people could book you, but can you talk a little bit more about what it looks like to work with you? Yes, absolutely. So about a year ago, like I said, when COVID shut down, um, I was uh, doing a lot of meal prep and that was 90% of my business. And then we went online. So I started um, promoting private classes, like girls night, birthdays on Zoom. And so we did, I did a few classes with, um, with a few friends and then people from uh, Facebook and Instagram started noticing me and I started doing corporate classes. So I have worked with Univision, I have worked with Dell, I have worked with EA, I have worked with um, with health clinics, I have worked with Cody, I have a class coming up next week, a holiday class with Cody, they hired me for Hispanic Heritage Month, Tapestry. So all of these big companies have hired me to do team building cooking activities. So this is what we do. And we do it over Zoom or team. And I send them the recipe ahead of time. Of course they choose, um, the classes are about an hour and a half and they cook along with me. Um, awesome. And it's been just super fun. Um, we have made arepas. I mean, you would think that's a really difficult dish to cook, but we have done it with a few companies. Arepas, we have made empanadas, we have made picadillo, we have made uh, coquito, we have made wonton cups. Oh, Amazon is another big company that hired me. Do you remember the time that you did the pupusa and we did the wine pairing with it with Rioja wine? So that's how I started, right? Remember I used to do Airbnbs, like my friend had an yes. Airbnb. So when he wasn't using the Airbnb, he would let me use it. And I would charge right. like $60 per ticket, I think. Um, now, pupusas are like street food, right? Instead of street food, really cheap food, inexpensive food in El Salvador. So when I told my aunt I was going around <laughs> selling classes, um, for $60 per person, and we were doing it in these apartments, or I was going to people's homes, and one of the classes I did was you paired it with wine, which I thought was, like, so amazing. Um, and, and it happened It happened naturally, too, because I just got this wine sponsorship, and I was doing, like, all these different, like, in, I was walking around to different, like, events and parties and like, letting people taste it. And then I remember you said you had a pupusa. I was like, look. You want to see how it pairs with like Rioja? So I came over with a couple of the bottles. I, I met with some of your friends that were there. And and the best part about it was it wasn't so much. It's, it's like a it was like a family gathering. I didn't know anybody there, but it was just like so like it was such an experience. And we just all sat and had dinner together. We laughed like the funny old thing friends. Is they didn't know each other. I know nobody knew each so other. It's it just crazy. hilarious. Like we were like a family. Exactly. Like a family gathering. Um, and I started going to people's homes to teach pupusa party, to do pupusa parties. 
um, Pupusa making parties. And the one story that I remember, I used to literally have all my ingredients in a maleta and I used to go on the subway. And <laughs> I went to Connecticut. I went upstate with this Pupusa maleta, right? And um, one touching story is that there was this woman who found me on Google. This is before you, because I, you know, I wasn't on social media that much. And um, she had an adopted niece who was from El Salvador, who had arrived here when she was a teenager. And the, her aunt wanted me to teach them how to make pupusas. When we made pupusas, this, now she's an adult, this woman was like in tears. And she was like, oh my God, that's, that's, this is, this is from my country. You know, this is from my childhood. And she was, I was like so touched. Um, so those kind of stories were really like, really important in the beginning of my career. Cause I think it fired me up. Now remember, I couldn't find a job in the beginning of my career. So it was really hard for me. And so I invented my own, my own classes. And then I kind of just skyrocketed. And then remember, I was featured on Univision because of that story. <laughs> yeah. No, and you know what? It, it's it's important because, you know, technology, the way the world is going right now, the way things are, there's so many traditions that get lost. You know, so an elder passes away and nobody had the recipe or somebody has the recipe, but they didn't know how to make it. So you you're you're important because you could actually bridge that gap. You know, somebody may want to start new traditions with their family based on old traditions that have been lost within their family nucleus, and you get a chance to bridge that. So, so I definitely appreciate you. Again, I, I love your food. Um, I like everything that you're doing. Um, the people that I've recommended to, to work with you have been elated um, to work with you, and, and they just they can't stop thanking me. So I just want you to know how like proud I am of like your progression and what you're doing. And I'm looking forward to having dinner with you. I, I really want to do, um, I re I would really love to do a siembra, like dinner like that, you know, like where we all get together, we all cook together in one big kitchen. So I'm going to be looking for venues and hopefully if things like slow down with this pandemic, then we could actually make that happen in New York, maybe in Miami. I don't know. Let's get crazy. Yeah, let's do it. I'm happy to do something like that. You can some, have some all of your food, your food partners, right? <laughs> and you, know what, you know what's funny? Um, the concept is very interesting because I don't know if you remember uh, when Don Coqui opened. Um, when Don Coqui opened, they actually opened up uh, one floor of their building just for, for, kit, for cooking parties. And they would make pernil and arroz con gandules. The whole family would make it together. And then they would have dinner in a restaurant setting. Um, and me and Angie Martinez from Hot 97 at the time, me and Angie actually did the cooking demo for them. We did, we did Calaito salad together for their grand opening. And it was like a big media event. It was mostly for like the, the journalists and whatnot. It was just an amazing event. But it, again, it's just like you take perfect strangers and you put them in a room and you add the kitchen element. And it just, it really unites people. I think Jennifer said it the best, la comida nos une. You know, it so. does. And I think what's more important is our stories unite us. So what I've, what I've gathered also from, from people is that like, we love sharing how our, our differences. And I think that's okay. Like you make picadillo this way, you make it this way. But when we start sharing it, we also start learning from each other. Right. I, I, I Jordana said that you could sing. I didn't know you could sing. Jordana, what are you talking about? <laughs> you said that you sing when you cook? Like, what, what's going on? Like, like put us I, am not, I don't know, Jordana. Those are things we don't share. Those things are from high school. <laughs> <laughs> wow. What's your favorite song to sing, though? I used to be in chorus. Uh, that was a long time ago. Let's get back to cooking empanadas. <laughs> <laughs> I so I it. have my 10 empanadas here. This is what I'm talking about. If you put this on a tray like this, a smaller tray, you put them in the freezer, you wait for them to freeze, and then you can put them, put them in a Ziploc bag and you have them ready for the holidays because they last forever in your freezer, okay? 
But right now we're just gonna fry them up. Jordana, you're not allowed to tell any more things from my youth. <laughs> that was really funny. So I'm gonna put this on the side. Okay, so I'm frying them. I'm not using an air fryer. I think I'm gonna have to invest in one just because it seems to be the, you know, healthy, popular way to go. But not for nothing, I don't count calories. It's the holidays. Um, you need a vegetable oil. So you don't have to use grapeseed. You don't have to use um, coconut. Use avocado oil, canola. There's a controversy about canola oil. It's not the healthiest oil, but you need an oil that has a high smoking point. Don't use olive oil. Olive oil is not great for frying. It's better for sauteing or adding to your dressings, cooking uh, meats and stuff like that, but not frying meats, okay? So whenever you see your steak or something like that, use, of course, butter or vegetable oil. Um, coconut oil has a high smoke point. Peanut oil has a high smoke point. Or use uh, avocado oil has a high smoke point. Okay, good. I like avocado yeah. oil. And because I'm frying these, I need it to be at least a quarter of an inch deep. Not deep frying them. I'm sort of like half frying them because half of it has to uh, at least be submerged in the oil. You need a plate with paper towels. Now, it doesn't take long, but you need your oil to be super hot. That is a tip whenever you fry anything. Don't um, don't put your food, like if you're making French fries or anything that you wanna fry, it is what it's going to do is it's gonna soak up the oil and it's gonna be really soggy. So how do you know your oil is hot if you don't have a thermometer? Now it gets really liquidy, but if you start moving it, especially in the light, you see little waves. You see waves actually roll down at the bottom. And that's how you know your oil is hot and it's ready. Don't ever, or teach your kids to do this, because I've heard it from my, from my kids, not my kids, my students. They put water in the oil. Never, ever do that. Um, you can put maybe some flour or you can put uh, something like a, a spoon and it'll start sizzling. You can put maybe garlic powder something in there, a little oregano and it starts sizzling. And that's how I know it's hot. Okay, flour is probably the easiest thing to do. So my oil is really hot. And now I'm going to put See, it's sizzling. And that's how you also can avoid um, absorption of too much oil if you're not into, you know, fatty food, like it's for your oil to be hot. So I'm gonna add about three to four empanadas. You don't wanna overcrowd your pan. So that's what's happening. That looks great. So does anyone always you ask me how do you know? The bottom is going to get golden. This is gonna be super fast. It doesn't take that long. So you see what I was talking about? It's halfway submerged. Again, you can bake these. Uh, a tip if you're going to bake your empanadas is to do an egg wash. What is an egg wash? It is an egg, put it in a bowl, beat it, right? Whisk it. You may want to add a little bit of water, just like a, a tiny bit, maybe like about a teaspoon or not. But you use a brush, a pastry brush, and you brush the top of your empanadas. And what's going to happen, it's going to give it like a, a nice shimmery touch to your empanadas. So 
lift lift your empanadas a little bit be careful because the oil is really hot and then i'm looking for like a golden color okay again your filling is already cooked so this happens in minutes so i'm not worried about if i were using chicken or turkey you know you have to make sure your those specifically those meats have to be really cooked this is a great idea for like th post thanksgiving because you can use your leftover turkey or even your leftover like sides and create a filling of your own so just flipping them over i already i'm making four then i'm gonna make four more and then i'm done so it's it takes longer to actually like do the filling and all that stuff if you're gonna make picadillo than for you to fry them So, Jesenia. I'm here. Quick question. So, because you're Salvadoreña, and a lot of the recipes you do are, like, diverse from different parts of Latin America, have you ever had somebody come at you hard about, like, así no se hace eso? Like, did, did you ever get involved in those types of debates? My mother. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> But I mean, obviously, you're you're fusing a lot of stuff, and you're you're taking the best out of every culture, and and trying to make it a better thing. So I'm wondering if uh, if there are purists out there that say, "Eso no se hace así." My grandmother yes. made it this way, or whatever. Like, um, in my I teach all different cultures, and I also teach different ages. The grandmas will tell you that's not how it's done. Um, I think because we live in New York City or in this, you know, this part of the world, um, we are open to different cultures and different cuisines and different food. Um, I'm the kind of chef, and I think also I'm the kind of person that I give recipes and their heritage, their respect. And I will say in most of my classes, and if I haven't said it here, this is my way of making this specific dish. But then that's why I want to hear what other people want to say about how they make this dish and what memories it brings for them, you know? Um, I haven't had anyone really, like, get angry at me because I don't think... I think when it comes to food, people just appreciate that it's being shared, especially what's happening now with like the Central American culture. Like I feel like everyone is asking me to do Salvadoran um, recipes and things like that that haven't been shared before, you know? Um, and when someone tells me, eso no se hace así, like, if you don't make it that way, I'm okay with that. <laughs> you know what I don't do, though, George? And I think this is just has, this is more about who I am. I don't claim to be right. And all the time. I don't, especially when it's traditions and traditional recipes, I know that that person really believes that's the only way to do it. And funny, I said my mother, but in El, before I went to El Salvador, I took a trip to El Salvador this summer, and I haven't been in years, but I took a trip to El Salvador this summer as a chef, right? I used to go around saying that this is the way Salvadorans do it. This is the way Salvadorans make pupusas. This is the way Salvadorans make certain things. And when I was in El Salvador this June, I learned I was wrong. Mm. Different families and different towns, like you were saying, uh, they add eggnog in, in Aguadilla, right? Eggs, eggs, ginger. Eggs, um, into, not eggnog, eggs into their coquito. Yeah. And I went to El Salvador and I learned that everybody makes pupusas differently. Everybody. And 
I was like, oh my God, like what have I been saying? This isn't the way you make pupusas. You know, some people add raisins, some people add this, some people add that. So I think being open-minded about how even families make their recipes is really important. My boyfriend makes certain recipes like his family and laugh for nothing, we're from the same village. <laughs> so he eats certain foods completely differently than I do, you know? Wow. Well, that's like the old thing. That's just like the old thing with the pizza, right? I always tell people, like, everybody says, oh, the pizza in my neighborhood is the best. And it's not necessarily that the pizza is the best. It's that it's what's tied to our memories. It's tied to experiences. You know, my pizzeria was, like, the first place I ever went on a date. It was where I hung out with all my friends. It's where I had my first fight. Like, you know, like, there's certain experiences that are tied to my favorite pizzeria. And there's a reason why I love that pizzeria, you know? So... It's the same thing, I think, with all kinds of foods. You know, like there's somebody who makes it and there's a certain amount of love that went into it. Like I can't eat anybody else's pasteles except my grandmother's and my aunt's. Like they're, they're the two people, you know, my grandmother's no longer with us, my aunt is, so I still get to eat pasteles from her. But unless I learn how to make them from her, I don't think I'll ever eat a pastel again after that because it's tied to them and the love that I have for them, so. Totally agree, totally agree. And there's recipes that my aunt makes that I go from memory because, you know, and I'm like, that's the way you make it. But, but it's because you're right. We connect it to, to certain person. Now, what I do feel is important though, and which is something I feel I'm doing, at least in our culture, even though I'm teaching recipes from Peru and people are like, oh my God, you're Salvadoran. Why are you teaching recipes from Peru? We have a lot of things in common. So what I learned is technique, and that's what I'm sharing. But what I think is happening is two things. We're writing our recipes down. I'm getting people to write their recipes down. I'm getting people to measure ingredients, because that's really important. And I'm getting people to actually share stories about their recipes. Um, and the third thing that I'm doing, and I think a lot of new chefs are doing too, is that our foods don't need to be gourmet, okay? They don't need a chef's name to be in front of it. Our foods don't need to be fine dining. So there's technique in our foods, like culinary techniques, right? Just because they're not French or Italian, but there's technique, there's sauteing, there's pickling, there's pastries, there's baking, there's, you know, deep frying, there's so many culinary techniques, there's whisking it this way, whisking eggs that way. Um, and I feel like we need to talk about um, and, and really level up our food because we have some amazing traditions and that we should also share with the young generation, most importantly. Absolutely. So I know we're almost out of time because we have our class till 10.30, right? And we're almost done. I have two more empanadas and then I'm done. So I, I have one question. Who, who's eating all of this? Who what? Just you, Just you and your boyfriend? You're having coquita and empanadas tonight for dinner? Well, I just want to let you know that I fly back into New York tomorrow, so. <laughs> you are more than welcome to come over. <laughs> I'm not too far. I'm in Kew Gardens, you know, so. So funny. So Bianca um, wanted to express her gratitude. She uh, uh, wants to thank you for this experience. Oh, and thank you. And I also shared, if you're watching this and you're loving this class, please consider a love donation to Chef Desenia by visiting the registration page where you register for the class. It's bit.ly slash Chef Desenia. 100% of your tips go directly to her. There's no money to be made here. We want to make sure that we just appreciate your energy. Um, and, and, you know, and we're, we're grateful. We're grateful for you for this experience. 
This video is going to be watched, I'm sure, by tens of thousands of people, if not millions. And, uh, and you know, you're, you're doing something special here. You're helping people create new memories, new traditions, and, and be creative and experimental, uh, experiential. You know, yes. get a chance to actually try out their own things and their own tastes and hopefully teach that to their kids. Oh, my I mean God. I love it. <laughs> I love it. This is amazing. That is my empanada class. Oh, man. Um, And you also have a little bit of picadillo left over, right? This you can put it, you can freeze it. You can make some rice, some mashed potatoes. Yes. Definitely won't go to waste. Eat it with your pegado. <laughs> or like Dominican exactly. say, con con, el con con. Um, see, that's one thing I won't make because I know that's really hard to make, con con and pegado. Yeah. I leave that for the professionals. <laughs> I got I'm gonna serve my coquito. So I have my my. We're gonna live here. vicariously through you right now. What she said? I said we're all gonna live vicariously through you. <laughs> Just make the recipes. <laughs> and I have. I'm gonna shake it a little. Let's see. I hope it didn't get too cold. Sometimes, see, that's what happens. It gets too cold. And then the fat, like, makes a film, right? Like, a, not a film. Like, a, como se dice? You help me here. What word is that? Um... A coquito barrier. <laughs> a barrier, exactly. It's stopping me. So you see, I took a knife and or take something, a fork or spoon, and kind of break it up. So that's what happens in the cold. That's why I said leave it, um, take it out at least an hour, half an hour before you serve it. See, that's that that's my kind of serving. <laughs> that's awesome. And Nicole, Nicole say we both, you you both make a great team for this. Thank you so much. My pistachio coquito is amazing and the empanadas are delicious. Nicole, please, if anybody, not just Nicole, but anybody, if you're doing the recipe, if you're actually making it, please send us your picture so we can share it online. Share it and then just hashtag social sofrito. Actually, no, to hashtag nuestra cocina so that we can actually share them out. Uh, with I want to hear with Nicole. Uh, did she use ice cream or did she use a pistachio? I know hear she me, said right? ice cream. Bake, bake my empanadas in the oven, perfection. No leftover filling. My son ate it all, says Jordana. Jordana, I am so proud of you. Jordana was like, I never seen these ingredients before because she, she messaged me. I'm like, you'll find them. <laughs> That's so awesome, Jordana. Well, I just want to um, go on the record again and say, Chef Jesenia, I love you. I think you're amazing as a friend, as a, a collaborator. We've collaborated multiple times. And now you're doing this for the Sofrito for Your Soul community so that they can have a beautiful, wonderful holiday next to their family. Some of the people are actually like seeing their family for the first time in two years. Um, so let's make it special. Please send us your pictures if you actually use these recipes at all so that Chef Jesenia can see what you uh, put your hands on. Um, hopefully we'll do another one of these. I think that uh, the consensus is that this is an amazing event. So I think that we could do other ones with different, you know, countries and, yeah. and what um, Please share it out to everybody. Nicole does say I used ice cream, but then I used a box of instant pistachio pudding mix. That's interesting. That's interesting. That is definitely interesting. Well, mi gente, that's all the time that we have tonight. Enjoy your empanadas. Enjoy your coquito. Drink responsibly, please. Uh, and just have a happy holiday. Okay, we'll see you next time. Thanks again. I also want to thank again Capicu, Latino mm -hmm. Movie Night, um, Chef Jesenia for donating her time uh, to, to, to spend with you tonight. Um, 
without you, you know, this is no nada, you know, this is. <laughs> we had a two-hour party. <laughs> Absolutely, but you're the only one eating, though. You, Nicole, <laughs> Jordana, nobody in. There's nobody in San Francisco doing this right now. Like, what's going on? <laughs> anyway, mi gente. Also, I wanna just one more time before we close. I wanna um share uh if you want to book Jesenia for any of your for private classes, dinner events, private cooking lessons, consulting, nutritional workshops. Again, <clears throat> she specializes in diabetes and, and diabetic menus. Email her at gomezjesenia at gmail.com today. I'm going to put it up on the ticker so you could get that information so you can see it. Um, also, make sure that you follow her, chef underscore jesenia, on both Twitter and Instagram. On Twitter, you can share your pictures and tag her. That way, she'll show a global audience. I mean, she is global. She could do this virtually from here. She could fly out to places and do this. So she's, you know, she's well on her way to becoming a bona fide celebrity chef. Um, and again, once one last time, if you're watching this on replay, you can email us at Nuestra Cocina Live at Sofrito Media Group.com and we will send you these recipes. We'll send you the actual recipes so that you could actually watch the video on replay and follow along with the video. Yesenia, thank you so much. I appreciate you. Thank you, George. Right, and we'll see each other real soon, okay? <laughs> and that's it, mi gente. One more time, let's listen to this commercial. And make sure you submit your recipes and your videos and all that good stuff. We need it. Thank you.